of heaven uh, would lay down his life so that he could purchase men to himself. Father, would you awaken love in our hearts, uh, Father, in this hour. Would you pierce us now uh, at the core of our being, uh, Lord, uh, for the, the days ahead and for what uh, you have us to do. Father, would you quicken in us, Father, the, the task at hand and the callings upon our lives, Father. Would you breathe afresh and anew, God, on the gifts uh, that you've placed on the inside of us that may feel dormant to us. Father, would you breathe uh, again uh, upon us and awaken your bride uh, that we might walk in full bridal partnership with you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Got a couple of papers there. Uh, uh, the... For whoever comes in, if y'all could just point out that there's more papers uh, back there on the back table. Um, so uh, we're going to talk th to more, this, you know, I've touched a little bit uh, on this from time to time over the last few years, but I thought it would be good to go in depth um, about what Constantine actually did and what ramifications that had on us, the church, the ecclesia today, because if we can understand what he took away, then we can better uh, get back to what God originally planned uh, for the church to look like and for, uh, for what we're supposed to do. Because as we'll see in just a moment, one of the things that we see that's really lacking in the church in this hour is passion, power, and authority. Would you not agree with that? I mean, are you satisfied with the status quo? Is this what Jesus died for? Is this it? I mean, that's the question we have to ask ourselves time and time again. Is this what he died for? And I would say the answer is absolutely not. Ezekiel 8, 6, and 16 say this, and he said, Son of man, do you see what they're doing? Things that will drive me from my sanctuary." He then brought me to the inner court of the house of the Lord, and there at the entrance of the temple, men were bowing down to the sun. Now this happened even after uh, those days. This happened yet again. This was in Ezekiel's day in the 722, 586 B.C., but even in the 70 A.D. and uh, 100 A.D. and 200 and 300 and all the way up until 700 A.D., we see this tug of war in the spirit uh, good versus evil, God versus Satan, over the hearts of men. That's what he's after. He wants uh, your heart in this hour, and he's determined, one or the other is determined to have that, and it's up to you. You're the deciding factor. It's your choice. Who are you going to serve, like Joshua said? Choose this day whom you will serve. All right, uh, we'll get to that in a minute. The, the, the picture's on there. Uh, for something we'll get to on the second page. Let's look at the history. Number one, the early church was the most powerful institution the world had ever seen. Pagan religions could not compete with it. Greek philosophy could not comprehend it. And persecution only purified it and caused it uh, to grow more rapidly. Is that what we see today in America's church? Do we see... Uh, the church exploding under persecution? Do we see signs and wonders and miracles like they experienced uh, in days of old? No. One of the things that we've heard Pastor Edwards talk about here is that they're closing churches in record rate, aren't they? We're not exploding. We're imploding, aren't we? That's not good. Something inside of us needs to awaken on the inside and go, this is not good. This is not what God intended it to be. Yet by the 6th century, it was largely destroyed by the year 600. Almost nothing that had characterized the early church remained. The church became a corrupt political power, hated and feared by the common people, with little evidence of life and power it had once known. How did the early church die? The event that eventually brought an end to the early church church took place in the fourth century. It was an insidious event engineered, I believe, by Satan himself. Surprisingly, it was an event that came in the disguise of a great blessing. The death knell for the early church was the conversion of the Roman Emperor Constantine. And as we'll 
discover over these next few pages what he actually stole from the early church and what God wants to restore, I believe, right now in this hour to the church is what the church lost here in Constantine's day. He wants to restore us to what we once had before. Never in our history, I mean, you can look back hundreds of years, thousands of years, 1,300 of them to be exact, and we have not seen a revival like the early church fathers, the apostles, the twelve, that turned the world upside down. We haven't. That lasted almost 700 years. Does that make, does that comprehend, I mean, can you comprehend that? I mean, from one emperor to the next, under greater and greater persecution, the church thrived and grew and exploded across continents. Okay, they sent out apostles and prophets and teachers and evangelists and pastors all across many continents of the world. And yet we see nothing like it. We've had a, a, a blip here and there. It was the year uh, 8312. It was the time of turmoil in the empire. The imperial throne was empty and several rivals fought to seize control. Two of the great rivals were Constantine and Maxinatius. During this struggle, Maxinatius challenged Constantine to battle. Constantine, alarmed by rumors that Maxinatius was a master of magical arts, prayed to the supreme god for help. And this is what Constantine saw. Constantine, to Constantine, the supreme god was, was Mithras. He's the Persian sun god. In response to the, his prayer, he reportedly saw a vision of a flaming cross in the sky next to the sun. Along with the words, conquer by this. He then confronted Maxinatius and won the battle. The result was this. Constantine came to the throne with the announcement that he was now a follower of Jesus. The, the Christians could hardly believe it. The church had gone through centuries of scattered local persecution. Then during the reign of uh, Dicolation, AD 287 to 305, they endured one of the most severe persecutions the church had known. Persecutions uh, were brutal and empire-wide attack on the church. Many thousands were tortured and killed. During the 18-year period, the church lost all of its leadership. How many of you know that when you read the scripture that when the shepherd is struck, the sheep scatter? Here's a Here's early evidence of what's now taking place uh, in this in 287-305. Since the leaders were the most visible members of the church, they were the first ones killed. Bibles were confiscated. It was a time of great distress. Almost everyone in the church saw friends or relatives martyred. But now a new Roman emperor had come to the throne claiming that he was a Christian and a follower of Jesus. To most of the church, this seemed to be an answer to prayers. Christianity suddenly changed from being a, an illegal religion to being a favored religion. The days of persecution and ridicule had ended. Christian leaders who had once looked who were once looked down upon were now given great honor. It became an advantage both politically and socially to be a Christian. I'm getting all these names wrong, so if you know better than I do. I'm just making it up as I go along, okay? <coughs> Eusebius wrote that Constantine was generous with money and honors for prominent converts. It's interesting to me that Constantine went after the elite of the society. He treated them with great favor. These are the movers and shakers of society, much like today. The seven mountains of influence. That's who Constantine went after. Those who shaped culture socially and economically this is who um, Constantine went after the result this resulted in a large number of upper, upper class conversions he proclaimed Sunday as an official Roman holiday so Christians could worship freely he gave his Christian soldiers the day off on Sunday later he made uh, rest on Sunday obligatory for all Constantine spent large sums of money building churches. Many were erected in Rome itself, and magnificent buildings were put up on famous sites in Jerusalem. Numerous churches were built in the new capital and throughout the empire. 
Constantine donated a great deal of property to create endowments for the churches. One writer commented that in Italy he despoiled the imperial patrimony for the benefit of the new god. As a result, the church soon became the single most important landowner in all of Italy. Interesting. In AD 365, Constantine's son, Constantius, took Constantine's actions one step further. He, pro he prohibited all pagan sacrifices on the pain of death he closed all pagan temples and destroyed many of them and converted uh, others to churches. For Christians, used to centuries of persecution, these changes were wonderful. With newfound freedoms and privileges that resulted from Constantine's conversion, the church joyfully hailed him as the new Apostle Paul. The results of these changes in the long run, however, were disastrous. The problem was this. Constantine legalized Christianity, but like most men of power, he wanted to control it. And what do they say about absolute power? It corrupts. Absolutely. And now he would try to improve upon it. In return of his uh, favor, this is number three, Constantine demanded control. One of the titles given to Roman emperor was Pontifex. Maximus, high priest. By Roman law, the emperor was in charge of all religious affairs in the empire. The emperor, for centuries, had been the head of all pagan religious systems. Now that Christianity was a, re a legal religion, Christians warmly accepted Constantine as the Pontifex Maximus of the church. The, they hailed him, that should have been they, hailed him as the new apostle. He even viewed himself as an apostle in the Church of the Holy Apostles. Constantine set up monuments for 13 people, the 12 apostles and himself. And he was much larger than the other 12. You can see it's already uh, the, the, the divine design of the enemy uh, in this plan in Constantine's life. You can see even at the very beginning uh, how the enemy is weaving into his heart. You know, it's it would be much like the political system of today. We see good men and women come to office and experience power and fame for the first time. And in order to handle that and steward that properly, that you have to be cloaked in quite a bit of humility. This was not one of Constantine's strong points to be cloaked in humility. He liked the attention. And I heard someone say, when you start believing your own press, you're in a lot of trouble. <coughs> and Constantine believed in his own press. He believed that everything that he was doing was right. As Constantine looked at his new religion, there were many things that perplexed him. This is always interesting. There were things that were, were perplexing to him because he saw these uh, people being disorganized and lacking the organizational skills of the Roman Empire. It particularly bothered him that Christianity seemed to have a strong Jewish element. So he began to make changes. In the year 325, Constantine called and presided over the first general council of the church, the Council of Nicaea. While its announced purpose was to settle doctrinal disputes, Constantine used it as an opportunity to reorganize the church and give it a new image. The church needed a facelift in his mind. This church, the church was so grateful to him for his blessing, they let him do it. They started giving up the truth for their newfound comfort, didn't they? Why, why, why would they do that? Well, if you've been persecuted for almost 700 years, you'd find it easy to give up your absolutes of the Bible in order to maintain this new level of comfort, <coughs> favor, and blessing that you are now receiving from the man who's the highest of the high. The death of the house church. The focus of early church life was the house church. Each local church was divided into units small enough to meet weekly in homes where fellowship and ministry could take place on a personal basis. 
Although the church met regularly in larger meetings, the house church provided the foundation of all church activity. Constantine built a church called St. John Lateran in Rome. The style of building is called a basilica. Its interior design is patterned patterned after the throne room of the imperial palace. At the front of the basilica was a section called the asp. Which was reserved for the clergy. It had a throne in the center where the bishop could sit surrounded by a semicircle of his advisors. The throne was designed to reflect the bishop's new position as a trusted servant of the emperor. Facing the ass was a large open area, the nave, where the, the, the bishop's subjects, the members of the church, could come and listen. The setting was rigid and formal. Huh. Anything about this look familiar? How about this room? You know, uh, I was thinking about this as I was typing this up. I was thinking about how much fun... It is for when we get together after church on Sundays with different families and how much conversation and interaction and ministry, right, that we've done in those house meetings. There seems to be more uh, blessing on that, isn't there, when we sit down and we break bread together and we uh, lay hands on friends and people and we bring them into a place of what feels like safety for most, don't we? It's interesting that there are, some people would rather come to your house than to darken the doors of a church, right? How many of you know that there have been people that have been bit by the sheep? Ne ne I guess you've never been bitten by the sheep. Just me, huh? Yeah, if you've been bitten by the sheep, you would remember. Yeah. Um, maybe I don't understand, but why do you think he had such a problem that some of their customs were mainly Jewish? Like, why do you have such a problem? We're going to get into that. Okay. Yeah, it's coming. <laughs> I mean, do you not agree? Come on, Garth, interact here. Do you I not agree. agree? You agree with the fact? <laughs> is it not more comfortable when we get together at your house and there's a more intimate relationship that's that's happening? Do you not have you not felt the presence of God in your own home? When you, when you do that? I mean, it's the open discussion. It's the yeah. It's the small group. Environment. So this feels more rigid and formal, doesn't it? Yes. I mean, look at Garrett. Rigid formal. <laughs> it's not very formal. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You look good today. <clears throat> also, I talk about comfort and a more security, and there's a comes with smaller, closer in your own place. Yeah. And what Garth was saying was that interaction and discussion, that was actually the style of right. teaching that the Jews and the rabbis had right. in that culture, which allowed for that kind of teaching and learning. If you go, and, and a, lot of, a lot of that looks like now the house churches in China. If you, as a minister from America, go to China, they'll have you sit there 12 and 16 hours discussing the Bible. And they'll have you come back and do it again the next day. And the next day, as long as you'll sit there and talk to them and the discussion builds on, on top of it, uh, one after another. Would you please see if you can get the air to work in there and change the mode, something. I am about to roast, spontaneously combust. Constantine then enacted a law that houses of prayer must be abolished and forbidding Christians from holding churches in private homes. This decree was harshly worded and designed to strike terror into the minds of his subjects. It went on to prohibit holding church in any place but the Catholic church. The change from the informal house church to the formal basilica changed the whole concept of church. Before church was a family of believer, after Constantine, the church became a building. I want you to let that sink in for just a minute. Because, see, we that, I think, is so deeply rooted in our psyche right now that the church is this building and not the family of believers that it's hard for us to even take this in right now. It's beyond... A building. A building is just where we gather. 
believers, the church is actually people gathering together. Wherever that is. Friends of mine in India gather in a parking lot. That's where they've held church for decades. They don't have a building. They are the church. That's something that we don't have a concept for. In, the, in China, they meet in caves. It's not a building. For fear of what? Persecution or death. Here's the other thing he did. He changed worship, number four. Not only did Constantine give the church new buildings to meet in, he decided to improve the way the church worshipped. And who better for him to decide than the great uh, emperor of Rome, right? Less than one year, less than a year after his conversion, Constantine made the following decree. I'm going to make plain to them what kind of worship is to be offered to God. What higher duty have I as an emperor than to cause all to offer Almighty God true religion and do worship? Worship in the house church had been spirit-led and intimate, with little in the way of set former liturgies. With Constantine as high priest, this changed dramatically. Uh, to Constantine's Roman mind, the highest expression of worship was found in the solemn rituals of the Roman imperial court. So they followed a set service. Do you, does that make sense? <laughs> I hate to break this to you. But they did like two fast songs and two slow songs. <laughs> They said a couple of prayers. They took up an offering. And they called that worship. Hmm. Where have I seen that before? This was Constantine's idea of what worship looked like. It had to be set up in a way, in a, in a design that uh, was mechanical. It took out your responsibility to engage with the Holy Spirit and have communion and fellowship in an intimate way, the way God designed it. And then out of that intimacy and fellowship, spontaneous songs would erupt within the group. Now when we see that happen, who in here gets excited? We may, every once in a while, we get off on this tangent where we break away from the form of service, right? And the Spirit breathes upon something. I, I want to just challenge you here. It's not that He's breathing upon it. It's finally that you fell into the vein of what He is about and who He is. And that's why those times are so exciting. We think, oh, they're so rare. <laughs> they're so rare because... We don't ever give him any space or room. We've so set up our services in such an order that we make no room for him because, God forbid, there's silence for more than a few seconds that people can meditate on the holy, awesome God that we serve. No, no, we've settled now today for someone getting up and entertaining us. And then every once in a while, God piercing through all that garbage and he touches our heart and a few people come down to the altar and lay prostrate and may cry or laugh. <coughs> Some may scream. But do you know that's the way God intended it to be? Every time we get together, that's how he intends it to be. This intimate, personal, lively, awesome encounter with him every time. What we have is not what he designed us to be. And listen, this is 1,300 years old. Or longer than that, this is 1,700. I mean, Constantine came up with this 1,700 years ago. I like my good friend Solomon, who said in Ecclesiastic, there's nothing new under the sun. And so the way they did this back then is the way we're doing it today. We've fallen into the same rut. We've lost the roots of who we are. We've lost the ability uh, and the awe of God and who he is. 
and we, we, we go into autopilot most times when we walk into service and we let someone else encounter God for us. These rituals were originally developed for pagan emperor worship. That's what they were originally created for. These were now added to the church under Constantine. Worship services became fixed, written forms of worship. Constantine did not just change where the church worshipped or how they worshipped. He struck at the very heart of what the church was. He cut the church off from its Jewish roots and grafted it into the root of Greek paganism. By the beginning of the 4th century, this church had developed a great deal of diversity. In Syria, for example, a group of Ebonites still survived. The Ebonites were heretical Judaizers who rejected the writings of Paul and taught that the Gentiles must be circumcised to be saved. You know, Paul dealt with that in Galatians. At the other extreme, in the large metropolitan cities of Rome and Alexandria, the church had been strongly influenced by paganism and Greek philosophy. These churches rejected much of their Jewish heritage, mingling pagan practices and ideas with those of the Bible. Early on, most of the empire held fast to the Jewish heritage held by the apostles. If we were looking at these type of churches from a 21st century perspective, they would look a lot like a Messianic Jewish congregation. Gentile members walked in the liberty of the New Covenant while benefiting from the rich heritage of their Messianic roots. However, when Constantine came to power, all of this began to change. One of the things I think that we've lost and really don't understand is the church was created by a Jewish nation. And their God, their Messiah, was a Jew. Remember when I told you 10 years ago, Jesus showed up and he said, Ron, I'm a Jew. Think like a Jew. Don't become a Jew. This is not about becoming a Jew. This is not about following laws. This is not about any of the Old Testament practices of the Jews. This is about... Jesus Christ will be a Jew for all of eternity. And in order to understand him better and to understand our faith better, you have to have a Jewish mindset. But what happened was the Greek mindset Constantine brought in and pagan worship he brought in changed everything. We need to be upset about that. Something on the inside of it says, should say, I want that back. If, you, if I came into your house and took something from you that was very valuable to you, you would want it back. The enemy took something that was very valuable to the church, their messianic roots, and you as believers should want it back with a great tenacity. There should be something rising up on the inside of you that says, I want back what we lost. Like many Romans, Constantine hated the Jewish people. He hated them. The Romans had long considered the Jews peculiar for their strange ways. They didn't jihad. Why? Well, they were pagan. They worshipped pagan gods. The Jews worshipped the one and true and only living God. And he required a certain set of things in order to approach him because like last week, we talked about he's holy and he's commanded that we be holy. Do you remember that? And what does holy mean? Who remembers? You're special. You're not ordinary. He sent his only son to die on the cross because you're not ordinary. You're special. Same God. The Jews, uh, but for, after Israel's rebellion against Rome and brutal defeats in AD 70 when the temple was destroyed in AD 130, Romans openly despised anything Jewish. Officially, the Jews were labeled a conquered people hostile to Rome. Due to Const- Constantine's hatred for the Jews, he determined to establish 
a paganized Christianity of Rome and Alexandria as the standard for the entire church. Every church in the empire was commanded to conform to this non-Messianic standard. Those who would not conform were severely persecuted. Constantine's attempt to purge the church of its Jewish elements began with the Council of Nicaea in AD 325. He declared it improper for the church to follow the customs of the Jews. Speaking of the church's observances of Passover, he wrote, Let us then have nothing in common with the Jews who are our adversaries. This irregularity of observing nothing, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this irregularity of observing Passover must be corrected in order that we may no more have anything in common with these parasites and murderers of our Lord. Now, what was he doing? Did the Jews murder Jesus? What's the truth in that? Charity will answer that. But who <clears throat> murdered Jesus? Who? Why is he? Why did he die? He died because of you and me. So who murdered Jesus? We did. That doesn't feel good. <laughs> It's not supposed to feel good. We, we, we did. We crucified him because of the sin. We have no ability. They had over 614 laws in the Old Testament that no one could fulfill. So he had to abolish the law, right, once and for all. And what did he do? He had to come and lay down his life so that we were no longer <laughs> under the curse of the law. Which what was the curse? You died. The curse of the law was, was death. All that, could, all that could be done in the Old Testament was your sins could be atoned for once a year. When? In the month of Tishri. Goodness, I'm trying to tie all this together for you people. So the month of Tishri <laughs> was the one... Sorry, I'm sorry, Neil. There was, they, they got atonement. What was atonement? I've talked about this before. It was a credit card payment, but someone was ultimately going to have to pay the bill. Right? All the, the, the blood of goats of sin. The blood of goats and sin. <laughs> Jesus. The blood of animals was not sufficient enough. Right? So it was only a credit card statement. That's the best way to look at it. It was a credit card payment. And so Jesus came to settle that payment once and for all. And here's Constantine now taking away one of the feasts of the Lord in Leviticus 23, the feast of Passover. He said you can no longer celebrate the feast of Passover. The very next day is the feast of unleavened bread. The day after that is the feast of first fruits. And 50 days after the feast of Passover is the feast of Pentecost. Did you get that? And so what was he really saying? You know what he was taking away? It would be like Constantine saying, you can't read this anymore. Which we'll get to in a minute, because he does. That, that's what ultimately happens. So you can't celebrate. You can no longer celebrate, because when the Feast of Passover came around, what began to happen is they would begin to celebrate what their Messiah had done for them. See, the feasts are designed to take us on a journey throughout the entire year of experience and encountering the Lord, and now Constantine was wiping it out. It should make you mad. Bernard Lazare describes the changes resulting from Nicaea this way. Before Nicaea, Christians attended the synagogues and celebrated Jewish holidays. It required the actions of the Nicene Council to free Christianity of its last bond by which it had still been tied to its cradle. Those who followed Jewish practices were marked, accursed, and cut off, which eventually evolved into a crime against the state punishable by death. We should not assume that the acceptance of Nicaea's decree was immediate, and universal for hundreds of years, additional church councils found it necessary to rep 
hate the ban on messianic Christianity, often threatening severe punishment for those who continued to celebrate Jewish heritage. And listed below, you'll see one after the other in 345 AD, in 365 AD, in 506 AD, in the 7th century, and then in 787 uh, AD, they have to keep going back and trying to purge the church of its Jewish roots. It took them seven or 400 years to literally stamp out the Jewish root system of the church. So a total of 700 years from when the church is formed until, the, until this time, it took them to stamp out uh, the truth of the gospel. That's, that's pretty long-lasting in my book. It's pretty amazing that, that even after seven, almost a thousand years, people were still holding on to the truths of God's word, their root system. And now today we treat it as something that is obscure and we don't understand it. So why, why even dig into it? You know, that's, what, that's the way we treat it. Well, Ron, you're talking a bunch of gibberish. Why should I care about those things? Maybe the reason that we lack power and authority in the church is because the root system has been cut off. Have you thought about that? Maybe the reason that we, in just a minute, you're going to see a quote, which is, I think, quite startling and representative of today's church. Next page. You can read those on your own. In light of these statements, one must ask an obvious question. If the Jewish elements of Christianity died out before the end of the first century, as many had been taught, why were church councils still fighting to stamp out these influences 700 years later? So the, there's a teaching, it's called uh, replacement theology, that we, we are now the spiritual Israel. It's hogwash. We're the wild branch that's been grafted in. Read your Bible. We can't, be, we can't live and exist on our own. We have to be grafted into the root system. The influx of paganism, number six, seven, sorry. Constantine not only divorced the church from Judaism, he married the church to paganism. Uh-oh. This is where it gets really ugly. I'm just going to warn you right now, if you don't think you can handle this, this would be a good time to get up and leave or turn off the video. <laughs> Constantine claimed to be a Christian, but did not seem to understand who Jesus was. He didn't, know who, he didn't know him. He had no personal conversion with Jesus. He had no relationship. He had an idea of what Jesus was, but he had no personal encounter with him. <coughs> Constantine was a devoted follower of Mithras, the Persian sun god, the unconquerable sun. When Constantine saw the vision of the cross in the sky next to the sun, he apparently assumed that Jesus was the manifestation of Mithras. Because of this, while Constantine professed to follow Christ, he also continued to, continued to openly worship pagan deities. Uh-oh. Constantine's triumphal arch, built after his conversion, bears the image of Mithras, the unconquered son. Constantine kept the sun god on his coins in his new city of Constantinople. He set up a statue of the sun god bearing his own features. In 321, when Constantine made the Christian day of worship a Roman holiday, he didn't call it Christ's day. He called it the venerable day of the sun. That is where we get the name Sunday. Uh-oh. It's interesting that Christian Emperor Constantine named the Christian day of worship in honor of the pagan sun god. I hope you do know that Saturday is actually the Sabbath, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody does realize that. Yeah. Okay. Constantine's confusion over the identity of Jesus seemed to have infected many of the unconverted pagans now crowding into the church. Can you imagine? <laughs> I can't even imagine. The fourth century mosaic found in the city of Rome portrays Jesus as the sun god driving his chariot across the sky. By the 5th century, it had become common practices for worshipers entering St. Peter's Basilica in Rome to turn to the door and bow down and worship the rising sun, Ezekiel 8, verses 8 and 16. Isn't that interesting? 
This influx of pagan thinking infected the church in a number of ways. The early church celebrated the biblical feasts established by God in the Torah. The paganization of Christianity under Constantine replaced these with a new set of holidays. The pagan holidays of Rome were now baptized into Christian holidays. Here's what they said. Some, and and it, it, it talks about this, almost 400 years worth of them trying to stamp out the Jewish root system. And here's what they kept telling the believers in Christ. The Messianic believers, the Gentile believers, they kept saying, just, just Christianize it. Just put a Christian, throw a Christian label on that thing, and it's all good. That's what's being said here. If you haven't caught that yet, you need to pause and listen to me. They said, let's just Christianize this thing. You don't have to worry about it. We'll throw, we'll throw a Christian name on it, and it'll be all good. Nothing new under the sun. That's our good friend Solomon, the wisest man that ever walked the earth. Nothing new. So they, what was he telling him? He, he was telling them to ignore the scripture. <laughs> Go ahead and bow down to the pagan God. Call it whatever you want. Call it Jesus. Call it Beelzebub. Call it whatever you want. But just, by, just Christianize it. We'll call it Jesus for your sake because I've legalized Christianity. But we're, we all know that I'm going to be bowing down to Mithras. But he's saying, but in, for your sake, I'm going to call it Jesus. I'm going to change the holidays, but don't worry. I'm going to slap a Christian name on it, even though it's a pagan holiday, and it's going to be good. And Christians wrestle back and forth on the inside of themselves. Right? Tossed to and fro in the inward parts of themselves, knowing truth, but liking comfort. In a minute, you'll find out that Baal's name means being married or in covenant with Baal. That's what his name means. He becomes your master. So comfort has now become their Baal, their master over their lives. And so they're more happy with their comfort than they are the absolutes of Scripture. They've given up the good things, and now what are they doing? They're calling good evil and evil good. You can't separate that. You can't put a pretty name on it. It's still a pagan deity. It's still a pagan god. I don't care what name you slap onto it. And then they go, we're going to get deeper into this. Next week, we don't have Sunday school. But we're going to go so deep, it's going to cause you to cringe. You either might want to pray about coming (laughs) or just bring a seatbelt and buckle in. But I'm telling you, the truth, what does the Bible say about truth? Truth will set you free. Who wants to be free? Okay. Okay. While some pagan influences were evident in the church before Constantine, his decrees made paganized Christianity the official standard for the church. By the end of the 4th century, the empire was officially Christianized. Pagan temples became Christian churches. (laughs) Pagan shrines became Christian shrines. In some cases, pagan priests became Christian priests. Only the names were changed. (laughs) Pagans were told that they lived in a Christian empire and it was their responsibility to live as Christians. The trouble is even though they were now officially a part of the church, they didn't know Jesus. They were still pagans. Their beliefs had not changed. They responded to the official decrees by giving Christian names to their pagan deities and continuing to worship as they had before. One common cult was the cult of Isis. I think that's interesting. <laughs> and the fact of next, in two weeks, we're going to talk about when they worshipped ISIS. And it might blow your mind. It might cause you to be a little bit uncomfortable and unsettled in your inner man. But when they worship this deity, it may shock you. You're going to have to come back in two weeks to find out when that was. Or you may have to tune into YouTube. 
Or you may not just show up at all and you may not ever want to know. You may want to stay comfortable in what you know. Because you know what? You're not accountable to what you don't know, right? So you can stick your head in the sand and just go on. Life is normal. Wouldn't that be great? No accountability, no responsibility. Except the Bible says something about study to show yourself approved. Huh. The way it's narrow. Isis is an Egyptian goddess, was called the Great Virgin and the Mother of God. She is commonly shown holding the child Horus in a pose very similar to the early Christian pictures of Mary and Jesus. Worshippers of Isis began calling Isis by the name Mary. In this way, they could continue to worship her. Neato. Worshippers of Artemis, or Diana, also used this ploy through this the honor and reverence justly due to Mary was frequently perverted into a form of idolatry that would have horrified the mother of Jesus. In the same way, worshipers of other pagan gods used the names of Christian saints and martyrs. If you were a pagan farmer and you were told no longer to go to your temple and pray to the God of harvest, what would you do? You would go to the church building that used to be your temple and pray to the patron saint of the, of the harvest. This practice was widespread. The pagans changed the names of their gods to acceptable Christian names and uh, were able to legally continue their pagan worship. In this way, old paganism became more and more blended with Christianity. By the year 600, paganism had in inundated the church. Many of the church leaders were now unbelievers. Uh-oh. Those who fell fast to the truth were persecuted as enemies of the empire, superstition, and idolatry were rampant. Bibles were written in a language people could not understand and changed to the pulpit where they could not read it. The church became a powerful and wealthy political organization with little evidence of true spiritual life. When the political system of Rome crumpled, the church stepped in to fill the vacuum. The church became a respected military power, but lost the supernatural power of God that it once knew. Now, this next statement is what I wanted to share with you earlier. Legend has it that Francis of Assisi, Assisi sorry, was given an audience with Pope Innocent III. The Pope brought Francis into his throne room and proudly displayed his golden jewels. Do you see, Francis, he boasted, the church can no longer say, as Peter once did, silver and gold have I none. Francis replied, yes, your holiness, but neither can the church say, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Ouch. I'm going to let that sink in. By the year 800, church council had outlawed the Jewish lifestyle once embraced by Jesus. And the apostles. For a Christian to observe the Sabbath or celebrate Passover became a crime punishable by death. Obedience to these decrees was enforced through torture and execution. In italics down here, I put note this is not an indict indictment against the many go godly Christians in the Catholic Church today. Many contemporary Roman Catholic leaders would be the first to renounce the horrors perpetuated in the name of Jesus through these dark centuries. Finally, the result of Constantine's conversion was the Messianic church died. Most of the things that characterized the early church were gone by the 6th century, cut off from the rich sap of the olive root. The disconnected Gentile branches could no longer sustain life. For a thousand years, the church sank lower and lower. By the time of Luther, Luther the church was a political organization selling forgiveness in the form of indulgences. Now, I want to give you my take on that today. That was Martin Luther's day. Let me tell you what they're doing today. We are selling the grace message so that we can live a life of indulgences with no fear of consequences from a holy God. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. We are living a life. We're not selling forgiveness, but we're selling a sloppy grace that isn't biblical so that we can live lifestyles, like it says in First and Second Timothy, that are contrary to the Word of God and think that there's no consequences. And as we've learned in Jude, we had better 
ask God for the fear of the Lord to return to us. 